Congratulations, you made it to the X Phil. You can sit back, relax, unpack your bags, and we hope you enjoy the show. Hey there, Mike, a.k.a. MTB Trigger here, and with me as always is my co-host Ronald, a.k.a. Eric. If you are brand new, welcome. This is an Escape from Tarkov podcast where we talk about all things EFT, and our goal is to get better at the game, and we hope you come along with us for that journey. This week, we both had our patience tested in many different ways in Tarkov, so we're going to talk about that, but we're also going to break down a few things that happened this week related to patience and patient play, and how it might be able to help you strategically in your raids. So for Hideout Keeping this week, just a friendly reminder that we have a ton of new folks in the Discord, and in the last two weeks we've had more than five brand new players, meaning they just got the game and they reached out to us. We may have more than that uh, reading and lurking about, but we've had five directly reach out saying they just got the game within the last couple of weeks, and they found the show, and they're enjoying it, and they're trying to figure out this uh, crazy game that we all love and know to be Escape from Tarkov. So try to keep that in mind when questions come up in Discord. You all do amazing at this, but just wanted to do a friendly reminder that we've got a lot of fresh Tarkovians out in the Discord. And also for the rest of you that are not fresh Tarkovians, we'd like to shout out again the Hardcore Tarkov rule set guys. They're doing Tarkov in the uh, hardcore way, and it has been interesting. I've enjoyed reading it this week. You guys are a little crazy, but I think it's cool what you're trying to do. I think it's a fun new way to make Tarkov fresh once you've hit a certain point and done all the things that you would do in your normal progression cycle. So shout out to you guys again. And if you're looking for something totally different to try in Tarkov that's outside of the normal game mechanics, but kind of just a personal challenge, I suggest you check out that hardcore Tarkov rule set section in Discord. But besides that, best way to get in touch with me is always in Discord. Send me a DM, tag me in a message, or tag me in feedback in any one of the channels. We'll see it. We're in Discord all day long and enjoy talking with each and every one of you. You can also find me on Twitter at Ronald Gaming. And of course, a couple times a week, I hang out in MTB Trigger's Twitch stream and just chat, hang out. We talk while Trigger plays whatever game that he's playing. And of course, if you have something more formal, you can get that to the show at xpmedia2020 at gmail.com. And support for this episode is brought to you by Manscaped.com. Use code EXFIL, that's code XFIL, for 20% off and free shipping. Manscaped is the best in men's grooming hardware and product. Manscaped.com, code XFIL, get 20% off of your order and free shipping. Other ways you can support the show, share it with a friend or share it somewhere on the internet. All of that helps us, and as always, that's the best thing you can do for us. If you're looking to support directly, you can use Patreon for as little as a dollar a month. Or you can subscribe to my Twitch channel, and you can do that for free if you already have an Amazon account. So yeah, if you're looking for me, it's MTB Trigger on Twitter, Twitch, and Discord. But I think it's time to get into it. Ronald, how's your week in Tarkov, man? Well, we're going to talk about patience tonight, and that is very appropriate, because I had a week that tested my patience in Tarkov. It's kind of interesting. I get in ruts in Tarkov now, and this is our third wipe, and it's been pretty consistent. I think everyone goes through a cycle where the game either just gets sick of playing for what you're doing, or in my particular case, what happened was the game was forcing me to do things which I really don't find to be fun. And because of that, I got into a rut where I was just kind of uh, not wanting to play as much. But we pushed through it, and I look forward to talking about kind of patience tonight and that whole story and how that fits in. But before we get into that, a couple of specific things that happened this week. I have solar power, which means 
I am no longer worried about the Jaeger fuel boss, although admittingly it had, looks like they've increased the supply now because fuel cans are everywhere, just in time for me to have spent uh, $16 million on getting solar power this week. But that's okay. That's okay. Now six fuel cans last a, a whopping 300 hours of hideout power, which is, now it's just not a thing. It's crazy how that literally goes from being a concern every day to something you never think about. Uh, come on, Battle State. There's got to be somewhere in the middle there for us playing <laughs> in the hideout game. Lots of tasking this week. Uh, now well into the mid-30s, pushing through some things which I did not find fun, but I did anyways to get to my goal for this wipe, which is hopefully to get to level 40. Um, I, I, As most of you know, if you've listened to the show, I don't have really any interest in pushing to Kappa I don't really think that grind is worth it, but I do set myself goals for the wipe to get to, and this wipe, it's to get to level 40. So I'm hoping before they wipe us that I can get to level 40. But then at the end of the week, I told you I was getting into a little bit of rut, and you're like, I can fix this. And uh, you said we should play some factory, and I said all you had to say was factory, and I'm in. And we played two days of just stomping around factory and i would say we <laughs> we got used to winning so much that the one time that we lost it was kind of frustrating in the moment which was kind of interesting because it's just you know it, it you, when you get used to winning so much that you lose once it should be normal like it's okay to lose right but we were winning we were winning enough and stomping around and really just chatting it was no there was no ratting it was just run shoot and go and it was a lot of fun uh got me on my rut and now i'm kind of back into playing the game again so wow what a week but uh how about you it's amazing how sometimes you do things and you don't know why but they sort of wrap themselves back into being the purpose for playing the game and i'm just kind of laughing about it because i am proud to report that I did get Kappa this week. I was able to complete it. With that came a few stories that are just crazy. I mean, so at the end of the last week, on the last episode, I kind of told you that I had to do the scav bosses and still had a handful of other tasks. And a lot of people linked some really cool stuff in Discord as far as tools go for tracking the tasks. And I look forward to using that on the next one. But I just some of the stories that came up at the end of the Kappa were crazy. I went in to get Rishala, and it took a few raids to get Rishala, but I finally got Rishala. I had already had the Golden TT pistol from way before, because I killed Rishala a lot before I had the task. So I get Rishala, go into my first woods raid and end up killing sherman but dying with his key and shout out to mike aka make in discord because i know you're having the same exact struggle right now i saw the screenshot and it broke my heart we go in it was ronald and i i get sherman i get his key and then got killed on the way out so I'm frustrated because I got killed. I thought the task was done. I forgot that you needed to get his key out, which made me play differently. I would have played very differently if I knew I needed to get his key out. And I should have known. I just didn't. We go back in. I go in with a completely just garbage gear because I'm like, I'm mad. <laughs> and I know I need sniper skill. So I go in with like a Mosin, a vest, maybe a class four armor, and just wasn't expecting to do anything. But we hear this huge battle down at Lumber Camp, so we go down again, and there's nothing going on. We approach from the big mountain, we come down through those lumber piles, we heard all these grenades, all this firing, nothing to be seen. So I stroll into the middle of Lumber Camp, and lo and behold, I find Sherman dead in between the closed warehouse and the open warehouse like right in between the lumber piles and he's got his key on him no pmc's in sight no scavs in sight all the raiders are dead so i'm like rod dude we gotta go <laughs> we gotta get out of here i've got the key in the very next raid i never in a million years imagined this would happen 
So we get out and I got the key turned in. And that was that was the end of that night. So then following that, I had to get Killa. And I got him on my first raid on Interchange. Just stomping in there with an MP7. Found him. Already had the helmet. I killed him. Uh, ended up killing two more PMCs, but died on my way out. But I had already looted Killa's helmet. Again, I had killed him a bunch before I got the task, and I saved the helmet knowing that I would need to turn it in. So then I was on Gluhar, and Gluhar is where it slowed way down. I had to, I had to do reserve like 22 times, 23 times just to see Gluhar, and it was wild. But it was one of those things where since we had been talking about exploration and exploration fear so much and reserve probably being the map that I had the least in-depth knowledge on, I learned so much about reserve farming Gluhar and running to where he spawns. I learned where PMCs rotate. I learned dangerous places to go at the beginning of the map. And I think if I had to say anything, if anybody needs Gluhar or is looking to farm raiders, the absolute best chance that I found for finding them was going to the train yard basically immediately. So if you have to hunt Gluhar, go to the train yard because if somebody pulls the bunker and he didn't spawn, he may be there then. But I kept spawning over near the helicopter and I would just run straight to the train yard. And oftentimes someone would have fought him and killed him or I found him a couple times and died. It was just kind of a mess. but. Ended up having some phenomenal raids and just learning a lot. And then, you know, proceeded after that to get my raider kills. And uh, and ultimately had to farm labs for a fire steel and a fire clean. And then I farmed the reserve bunkers for the English tea. Ended up getting it. So <laughs> I spent an extraordinary amount of time in-game last week just finishing out Kappa, which... I was never really that focused on it, but just in helping other people play and my own progression, I ended up getting it done. It tested my patience, and it really comes up in a few ways. You know, we, we talked about going into it, so I think we just go into it, because playing the game in those tasks where it's forcing you to hit one objective or it's all you have left and you're trying to get it done, and Ronald, you mentioned this, man, where it's like it's you're being forced to do something that either you don't like or you're not comfortable doing can be really challenging. Interestingly, though, today I spent basically half of my stream having zero patience and just charging around on factory for the Punisher tournament qualification. And I'm happy to report that in my first attempt at the 60 minutes on factory, I posted up 35 kills or 35 PMCs killed in one hour in spam queuing factory. So I'm pretty pumped for that. But I, that was all I was doing. I didn't even pick up dog tags. I didn't look at their gear. It was killing 35 people and getting out as fast as I can so I could re-gear up and get in the next raid. But Kappa took patience in a bunch of different ways. But you and I also had some encounters together on Shoreline that I kind of specifically wanted to go through because it's kind of along the same lines. So I'm guessing you know which raid <laughs> which raid I'm thinking about. Yeah, it was an interesting raid. I was trying to get a task done where I'm trying to kill scavs at 40 meters without a sight on a Mosin. So you're running around thick, kind of in escort mode, and I'm running around with a piece of junk mose and, you know, shooting at scavs, right? And <clears throat> we come up kind of through the middle of the map, and we end up at the power station. And this is maybe about halfway through the raid. So the first round of people have been through the power station. Some dead scavs, that they've been through that. And we hear a war going on at, at the gas, at old gas down on in pier in that area. And so we're like, okay, well, this could get interesting. And uh, oh boy, did it ever. <laughs> I forgot that it started at pier, actually. 
right? Because we, what did we do? We spawned near Road to Customs. We went up to Weather Station and then kind of, we were hoping Sniper Scab was up <laughs> so you could get one of your kills there, right? And then we did. We heard that fight going on and it was like, okay, well, that's not at Pier and it's not at Power because we were pretty close to Power at that point. But it was in between, or it was somebody on the sniper rocks over pier fighting in. So we positioned ourselves, and Ronald was uh, up closer to resort, and I pushed up under the big power lines. And we see this team of three start to rotate in to the back of power so we heard all this fighting they're running up from the pier on the east side of the river right so they're on the side where the power plant is and they come running up over those hills and they went through the back fence into power and i see them i've got the angle and i had I can't remember what gun I had, but I was shooting some sort of assault rifle with good ammo, and I had a decent scope on it as well. I think I had a voodoo scope. And I kill one. And there's three of them. Now, this is where it got really interesting. So Ronald is across the dirt road, holding the north side completely. He's got an angle on the entire north yard of power, and he can also see that kind of uh, runway on the right side of power. So he can basically see the right wall as well. When I shot and took the one down, the other two went opposite directions. One went back out the fence and down. And then the other PMC went back into the little nook on the south side of power on the outside. So when the guy went down, I saw him kind of go into a bush, and I threw probably three or four grenades right to where he went. And he didn't do anything. He didn't make any noise at that point. And this other guy kept peeking and running from side to side, and he would run to the back, and then Ronald would take a shot. You know, you probably hit him. I don't remember if you checked your damage report at the end of the game, but <laughs> you had that guy terrified because every time he came up that left side or the far side from me which would have been the west side of power you shot him every time he peeked out that way yep he kept coming up and down and he would come out right past the footbridge into the main yard and i would shoot him or shoot at him and i know i hit him once and then he would run back and then he came up and I'd shoot and he's just running around like a crazy person and he would go back and hide. And so we figured that we were shooting at the same person because he was, you had the angle in the back and I had the angle on the side. And he kept running back and forth and back and forth. Yeah. So then I, in, in the back of my mind, I knew that the one guy had escaped down. But at some point I had convinced myself that I had to have naded him because this other guy just kept peeking and was running around like crazy. It seemed like he was trying to get the loot off of his teammate. So I said I was repositioning and moving a little to the left. And keep in mind, I have the automatic gun with the scope. Ronald has a Mosin without a scope. And he's at the long range position. I'm at the short range position. So at one point, the guy that was dodging us finally gets the courage to run out the left side and Ronald calls it and he says, Hey, he's out, he's leaving. And I'm like, okay, great. And then Ronald's like, no, like gone. Like he left and got out the bridge and I heard the shooting and everything going on and the shot just didn't connect. So I was like, Oh my gosh. So he got out. Okay. And I said, I'm going down. I'm going to check this body out. And I kind of waited for a minute, let it clear out, you know, because I didn't want the guy that left to, like, sneak up behind us or whatever. And so I finally decided to go down, check the loot from the one guy we killed. And as I'm going up to the body, I was, I in my mind, I was like, you know what, I wonder if I should clear below 
and I kind of looked through all the bushes and didn't see anything. And I looked over the edge towards the river, and I'm like, oh man, there's a lot of terrain there where this guy could have just, just could have left. So I convinced myself that that first guy had dipped. So I said, I'm going to loot this guy. Ronald says, all right, I'll, I'll push up to you. Right as he says that, and I hit loot, I crouched and I looted. I didn't even prone loot. I crouched and I loot, and I hear a shift just on the other side of the chain link fence from me, and this guy just full sprays into me and takes me out in a split second. I heard the, you know, 90 degree fast turn, and he just destroyed me. And I said, I'm dead. Ronald's like, what? And I'm like, remember the guy? I said there was another one. He was right on the other side of the fence. And so the reason that I wanted to kick this episode off with this story is because <laughs> this guy, no joke, probably was there. This fight carried on for 10 minutes. And it was a long fight. He sat there, didn't move, nades were coming in, his partner's trying to get cover, and he was able to wait that patiently for 10 minutes, knowing that at some point I was going to go check the body. And the truth is, is I cleared a lot of that area, but he won. He got me. There was nothing I could do about it. And at that point, Ronald's left with a Mosin. And I, I don't even remember how you finished the raid, to be honest, because I was so horrified that I didn't go clear down. And this guy just took... <laughs> I was I was decked out. <laughs> I was in full bodyguard mode. <laughs> so, yeah, that was it was an amazing play by that guy to wait, knowing the action that I would take at some point in that raid. It was incredible how rewarding it was for him, right? I mean, so he literally didn't make a sound for probably a solid seven or eight minutes because you would have heard it because you weren't making much noise either. You were just holding an angle. No, I, and was, I was right above them, right? At that, at that point, I was like 20 meters away because we had that guy locked into the back corner. So he would have been on the southwest corner where there's the little inset, and we had him pinned there. Yep, I was the one making all the noise, shooting at the guy trying to get out on the other side, and you really weren't making any noise. Yeah, it was pretty incredible. And, you know, and at the end of all that, it just goes to show you that playing patiently can really, really pay off. And it's hard when you're all amped up and ready to go. <laughs> And especially if you feel like you're backed in a corner and you have to do something to force it. In that particular situation, he didn't force it at all, just waited. Yeah, and I think for me, sometimes being patient feels like, man, if I sit still for 60 seconds, it feels like a long time. But one of the things that has just become so clear to me this wipe is how quickly you can get across all of the maps, right? We talked about it on Woods last week. You know, it, it takes just a handful of minutes to get across the entire map. And so waiting 60 seconds isn't that long. And at the end of the day, waiting seven minutes is really, really hard in this game. But there's times where it makes sense to do it. We don't have any idea that, I can tell you this, the guy's gear that was on the ground he was wearing a raid backpack, you know, he was wearing a couch, and I'm guessing he was, you know, Alton or Thick Boy Helmet, an x or something, and a good gun. You know, because if, if he was a naked PMC, I wouldn't have ran down there, but I remember killing him with a big bag on. So, yeah, it's, it's an interesting concept on how patience plays, right? Whether it's, <laughs> it's in raid, literally fighting another opponent, and how it can play out there, or you know, grinding through tasks or not grinding through tasks and doing other stuff. But there's this other piece of it too. It's like, not only did he not freak out and move when you were just lobbing grenades in that general direction, but he didn't move at all. So it didn't make any sound. And, and that is the other piece of success in Tarkov when you know that you're in a tough spot 
sometimes the best option is to just not move at all and risk it. Yeah. You know, he took that risk because you could have pushed and sprayed the bush and he would have been dead. There's nothing he could have done, right? But he took the risk of, okay, well, you know, he's kind of backed in a corner there and just that was his, you know, the best option that he thought of at the minute. But when you don't make any sound, Tarkov is such a sound game over everything else. It is so sound dependent, even more so than spotting, I would say, in a lot of situations. It's such a sound game. It is just really incredible play and something that if you can get good at that, if you can get good at not letting stress force you into a panic response to something, you really have a chance of getting out of a sticky situation. You know, I think what's interesting about it is, you know, Shoreline, I think we would categorize as a big map. It's one of the big maps. And the ability to play patiently, I think, is can be defined by the the size of the map, but it can also be designed by the area that you're in. You know, that that area was defined by a very pronounced structure. There's the big rock and hill formation that we started on, and then there's the big dip that they started on and this guy ended up on towards the river on the south side of the power station. So there's a lot of area for movement. There was a lot of nook and crannies that they can hide in. And when you contrast this with some of the smaller areas, like the resort, uh, the resort on Shoreline, there's not quite as many places that you could run or crawl to, but there are definitely a lot more nooks and crannies in the different doors and the different floors within the resort. So the way that you play patiently can vary widely depending on the structure on the map or the size of the area that you get encountered on. Absolutely. And there's so many other inputs that can cause you to feel a sense of urgency that maybe is a little bit artificial. Like I'm just thinking about the timer on shoreline, you know, is 45 plus minutes, right? You have so much time to work your way around the map. And if you get into a situation where just like this happened, we're 30 minutes in and you need to wait it out for 10 minutes, you still have plenty of time to get out or to complete a task or to whatever you're trying to do. Sometimes I think all of us as Tarkov players, I know I do, get this kind of false sense of urgency that keeps pushing you into making decisions that happen too quickly. Like you don't need to have like rapid fire, keep moving, keep running, keep scoping, whatever. Tarkov's not like that. You you can wait and sit in a bush if you have to for five minutes while something happens. And the the artificial urgency that comes, I think, we put on ourselves. The as the task timer is going down, it's like you frantically are, you know, hitting O to double check and see, okay, how much time do I left? How, okay, I got 32 minutes left. Oh, I gotta start moving. I gotta start moving. And the truth is, I think we put a lot of bad situations on ourselves. We get ourselves in bad situations when we start to have this kind of artificial urgency. Oh my gosh. Yes, 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 yes. Because it's little things, right? How long does it take to fully loot a body? If you hadn't done any looting and you just had a massive backpack, it can be really fast. But even then, it still takes a couple seconds you're immobilized, you can't see anything while you're doing it, your audio is obscured by looting. So had I just taken the time to clear out a little bit and not go straight into looting, maybe I would have found that guy, maybe he would have shifted in the bush. I don't know. But the other area where I see a lot of patience tested is being too quick to heal, being too quick to reload. Or not taking into account that, let's say there's two people on each team and your partner kills somebody and their partner kills one of your guys. The amount of time it takes to heal and fix limbs and get back into fighting shape if the fight does reset is extraordinary. 
And a lot of times you'll see players or enemies move way too quickly and not take into account that the enemy may not have moved that much because they wanted to heal or needed to heal. So that, you know, people don't disengage really quick or they're not quick to move in this game because it's not like other games where you pop one heal and you can do it while you're running full speed or whatever. Like it takes time. It makes noise. And, you know, having that patience and the read on the situation, did I hit them? Are they going to try to loot? Do they have a player on their team down? Do they have a reason to stay in this area? And all of those can affect what you need to do from a patient's perspective and how you should approach the situation. And as I'm, as you just said that, man, I was just sitting there thinking about it like, oh my gosh, you're so right. And I failed so hard at that in this raid. Well, there's another aspect to this as well. I mean, think about what just happened to me. So you got to rewind like five minutes before whatever is going on. Did you just own somebody in some crazy fight? Did you just get jump scared and your adrenaline's running crazy, right? Did you just get a task done that you've tried 10 times and you finally got your item, right? Or are you being chased by somebody? Something like that. Like the circumstances, even if you're in an area of the game where you really don't know where you are, like if you're in a map that you don't know that well, right? And you feel this, I don't know where the Xfil is. I don't know. I, I got to find a bush. Got to get out of here. <laughs> got to find a bush, alt tab and find a map. You know, we're we're in bad shape. You know, all of that. It's just about, okay, what is the last five minutes of Tarkov and how is that making you feel going into a new situation? Because every encounter in Tarkov, every encounter is like a mini raid. So during your raid, you're going to have encounters with scavs, PMCs, whatever. And as those progress, end and start, end and start, it's a whole new set of rules. Nothing is consistent between them other than the fact that it's somebody new that you're playing chess with to get through that piece of it. And you have to have that patience to carry through that entire like 40 minute experience, because if you make it 35 minutes and then go crazy and die, you lose in this game. You know, dying is losing in Tarkov for the most part. And so I just think you have to remember like what just happened. And sometimes you got to calm down and be like, okay, here we go. We're going to do this again. There's no game that can quickly snap me from being totally relaxed and having fun to complete panic like Tarkov. And you're right. It's an out of game thing. It's my own heartbeat. It's my own fight or flight response. Sometimes that gets me into so much trouble. You know, like if you round a corner and get shot, you know, there's this immediate thought sometimes where it's like, oh, I'm hurt. I'm really, I'm dead. We got to go. <laughs> it's it's time to get out of here. And it was a, you know, low penetration round that hit your thorax and did four damage. Right. But that doesn't change the fact that you got jump scared. And now you have to manage that physical response as well as figure out what to do in game. And it, it can change everything. And Sometimes those effects can last for minutes or the rest of the raid, you know, and everything that you've accomplished in the raid, to your point, dying ruins success a lot of times in Tarkov. So if you have a quest item, if you uh, planted a bunch of stuff, if you need to survive, and then something like that happens, and it's early in the raid, it can affect you for 20, 30, 40 minutes, that stress of getting out to get that task done and one of the things that I've tried to get better at this wipe and I still fail at is playing the same no matter what if I would explore that area do it even though I have a task item because if I got the task item I can do it again now I say that knowing full well that there were times that I said we got to get out I got the thing you know I got my ledx to get my fit case let's go but there's a lot of times where I was roaming around with a full bag and tasks done and all kinds of stuff. And, and that led to some really good stuff. And I'm working on not getting so flighty or fighty that, you know, I like PvP. If someone shoots at me, I like to shoot back. But sometimes the better play is to disengage. And that may mean to engage them later from another area or to really leave. And that's hard for me. 
as a PvP first kind of player, that is not my default response, but sometimes it's the better way to do it. And it's something that I will continue to work on probably forever. Yeah, and I have another story from this week that I want to throw out here about patience because something really interesting actually happened to me today. I've been trying to get the cult cultist part two done where you, you have to mark the different cultist rooms around Tarkov. And I came down to the final room for me on customs, the marked room and the third story in dorms and customs. I've tried this several times and I've died every time trying to get in and out of there. And I finally decided that what I was going to do is do it at night with a pistol and minimal gear and hide in a stupid bush around dorms and wait until about 10 minutes left and go do it. So I did this. I made my way in at dorms. I made my way to dorms. It was a one in the morning raid. I spawned over at the trailer park area and made my way across the middle of the map, no issues, and made it all the way over to dorms and was hiding in a bush right outside the entrance to three story. Something crazy happened. So I'm sitting there and I'm looking around. It's pitch black and it was kind of raining. So you really can't see or hear anything. And I know that I'm hidden. I know I'm in the bush. And all of the sudden, I hear footsteps getting closer. And I hear another set of footsteps with them. I'm like, okay, it's two. And I hear another set. Okay, it's three. And I hear a fourth set of footsteps running closer. And they all run and they get close, close, and they stop. And I could see one through the leaves. And I don't make a sound. I didn't move. And they, they're walking around, they're walking, walking, and then they all start running back the other direction and they, and they run off. They were only there for maybe 20 seconds total. But I just thought, wow, this is crazy. Literally, there's four PMCs around me or player scabs, I guess they could have been. But there's a group of four players around me. They don't know I'm here. All I have to do is just hope they don't see me. And hope they don't have a thermal. <laughs> I guess I never thought of that until now, but they didn't, <laughs> apparently. And just wait this out. And so there's 17 minutes left in the raid. And I remember this because it got my adrenaline pumping. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, okay, here we go. And the whole encounter took 30 seconds, but I didn't move. I didn't freak out. I mean, there's no way I'm going to kill all four of them with a pistol. And I just thought it was really interesting because I knew tonight we were going to talk about patience. One of the other pieces with that, I was able to get into dorms and get the marked room task done in that raid and then make it all the way back uh, to the ZB to Xfil. And I think what's super interesting about that encounter is if we hadn't have had our experience on Shoreline earlier in the week, I may not have had such a steady hand on my mouse, actually. It's just different phases of learning in Tarkov and I, I just, it totally shocked me. I have never had four players come up on me while I'm hiding in a bush waiting a timer out. Oh man, there those moments when you are gaining stamina or, you know, waiting to do something or you just don't have the gear to take it on and there's people all over. Oh my gosh, I it's, can't like intentionally get into them and I've only been in them a handful of times, but it just is, I feel like everyone's probably experienced something like that. And when you survive and come out on the other end, it's like, oh my gosh, I lived. Like, I, I, I heard all these people. It's, it's not the expectation. You almost expect to die when that happens. You're like, uh-oh, <laughs> footsteps, now what? <laughs> Absolutely. And one of the things I did do is I held my middle mouse button down. I was moving my head around, which doesn't make any noise. And that's when I actually saw one of them off the corner of my peripheral vision, which <laughs> totally, I didn't realize how close they were. <laughs> it's funny. And it was just absolutely, utterly terrifying. <laughs> well, it, it is, it's interesting, right? Because the, the, the feelings on both sides can be shocking, right? If you had, if you were in that four man's position and you had a pistol and it was suppressed or whatever, and you got to the point where you had a shot on one and you knew it was a headshot and you could take him out. If you shot a shot 
and dropped one of them, you're now scared because they now have some sort of sound to come after you. But that whole team is freaking out now, right? And we often don't remember that. We're so focused on what we need to do, what we just did, and our emotions and physical reaction to this game that in, like instilling the fear of dropping an opponent when they weren't expecting it, and there's four of them all next to each other, would have caused chaos, right? You may have been able to take a shot and not move, and they probably would have disappeared, maybe. Or they, they may have hunted you down, you just don't know. But oftentimes I forget that when you get surprised, the other person was probably just as surprised, unless they were truly holding an area, which does happen. And and that was kind of the thing I was thinking about with the big versus small maps to kind of bring it back to that is on Factory, I use this concept all the time. Now, I just told you that earlier in the episode that I literally sprinted around Factory and got 35 kills in an hour and just full W, full shift key running the entire time. But it's actually not my preferred way to play Factory. You know, I play Factory at a strategic pace, is what I call it, where I take every fight that comes to me, but I often utilize patience because I like to use what I believe most other players are going to do against them. And to me, that's a strategic advantage. So Factory, most people are trying to either get office kills, get up there to loot the safe, or they think that's where all the PvP happens. So I will often position myself or be ready to get in position to take advantage of somebody that's going to be doing that. So the things that throw me off are when, you know, somebody is more patient than I am, which does happen, or they just are running around erratically trying to clear every single corner, and that can throw me off as well. But the most interesting part about this is right after I completed the hour of running around like crazy, I had to relax and go back to my normal play style. So I went into factory and I got the glass hallway spawn. And I just crept out from glass hallway and was right next to the big tank there. And a guy came screaming across left to right. And I took him out in a couple bullets. And then I was listening, and I heard a guy back in forklift spawn, and I heard someone sprinting around in the middle of the map. And I made the choice that, okay, well, this guy's sprinting around in the middle of the map. Maybe he's running towards the shots that he just heard because he needs PMC kills or who knows what. And the guy in forklift's not doing anything. So I chose to just wait get my aim on the doorway to the middle of factory underneath the like if you, the door I'm talking about is the one if you look up there's the hole in the wall up in the rafters and it's the door right below that that concrete door with the chain link fence next to it and I literally just put my crosshairs right on that door saying well this guy's on my level he's running around if he's coming this way this is likely going to be the way he comes Sure enough, he rounded the blue dumpster, and I put one in between his eyes, and as soon as that happened, I look left, and the other guy is peeking the door right by where I killed the other guy, where the other guy exited, and I took him out too. And so I moved maybe mm, six feet and killed three PMCs and was able to set up a scab farm after that. So it, it's, it's interesting how you can take this concept and use it against players as well. If you're thinking about what are they doing, what am I going to do about it? And sometimes the answer to that is nothing. I'm going to sit here and wait. Or I'm going to position myself because I think this is where they're going to go. There's a thin line between playing scared and playing aggressive in this game. And with that, you can use the majority of that against somebody. And usually what it means is that you can scare them into doing something that's not in their best interest, either with a grenade or with shooting in a different direction on purpose to make, you know, or something along those lines. There's lots of things in Tarkov that, generally speaking, you can frighten a player into doing, which can put them in a disadvantage. And 
factory is an interesting thing because you don't need to play aggressive to win factory. You just have to be very, very intentional about what you do. You split the map up, you start clearing out the paths where the PMCs are going to run around or run to, and most of the time you can wait for it and it'll come right to you. And again, that's because on factory, I think people spawn in with an urgency that's not necessary. They're like, I got to do something. I got to run. I'm going to do something. I got to do something. The map's small. Let's go run. And you really don't have to do that. You can run around, but you on a small map, you just need to be very strategic and intentional with what you do. Yeah, and it's one of the things that, <clears throat> you know, if somebody's trying to learn factory, this is one of the things I outlined in our factory guide series, was that clearing spawns doesn't necessarily mean that you run into the spawn and clear the PMCs out of there. It's using all of the knowledge, all of the sound, all of the information that you're gathering during the raid to determine the likelihood of their player being there or not. And there's a lot of times where just the sound can tell you how many people are or were in the raid and where they were when they died. And it's something that every map has. You start to learn, like, it was kind of like when that shoreline example, the distance that we were hearing those shots, it was like, well, wait a minute, that's not pier and it's not power. It's somewhere in between. So we need to position to take advantage of that. And the truth is we had the positional advantage. They just strategically outmaneuvered us by being patient, right? But it was that sound cue that was like, wait a minute, that's, we could take advantage of that because we knew where it was, or at least we knew where it wasn't. And it wasn't at Pier, and it was in between us and Pier, which left them in one spot, and we took off their most likely rotation. We were right. It just didn't go our way. It all comes back to, in my mind, sound is such a huge part of Tarkov. And each map kind of has their own mini areas that you need to learn. And over time the first steps of getting into Tarkov are just learning what the map is and getting around in it and then how to extract, right? And then over time you start learning, okay, this kind of section of the map is this way, this kind of section is that way. And it's very generalized and usually not more than one or two areas. And then once you start to get to more intermediate knowledge in Tarkov, it becomes, okay, this building in Tarkov plays like this. It is sound here, people hide here, I can get sniped from this direction, right? And when you start to combine all of that, the big maps become small because each area is its own small little map. And so when something happens, you can easily say, wait a minute, that's coming from an unusual direction. And I know that something out of the ordinary is going to transact, uh, something out of the ordinary is going to transition to this area. So let's get ready for that. And because sound is such a huge piece of localizing where the action is and to where it's going to approach the position that you're at, that you need to just be very good at localizing that sound and then applying your map knowledge to figure out how you can get an advantage in a lot of different situations. Yeah, I think it can't be stated enough or overstated how important localizing sound is um, and the closer the sound is to you increases how important it is to figure out what direction it is and where it's going i really think that <laughs> this could probably be its own episode <laughs> talking about sound and tarkov and how to localize it but one of the just quick tips for localizing sound is, you know, when you rotate or move or reload or heal, it all makes noise. And since we've been talking about patience this whole episode, it makes me think that, you know, when you're in close quarters combat, you have to be really conscious of the noise that you're making that the other player can hear. But more importantly is if, they are moving towards you and you're doing a patient play, knowing which direction they're going, coming from and, and coming to you 
is really big. So there's a little trick with localizing sound. And one of the things that happens, and I've seen this in so many FPS, and it happens in PUBG all the time, uh, but I've noticed it in Tarkov personally as well, where oftentimes if someone's making noise or moving, our immediate nature is to point towards them. It's to put our cursor where the noise is coming from, so we're always kind of following it. And as stuff's moving away from you, that can be very effective. But the closer it gets, the easier it is for that noise is to switch, right? If they're three feet away from you and sprint from left to right, there's going to be a really big swing in where the sound goes. So if you're trying to follow it, you're going to be shaking your mouse back and forth. So this is another tip on crosshair placement where if you hold the most likely spot they're coming and then pay attention to where the sound is you're going to have a better chance of making the better play as the patient uh, part versus the aggressor but the other thing you can do is if you do hear noise like a grenade or a gunshot there's usually a resonation of the f of the sound at least for a moment and if you quickly move your crosshair, you don't have to do it more than like five degrees either way, but if you move your crosshair left and right, you can determine, first of all, if the sound is in front of you. Because how many times have you heard an explosion and it was actually behind you 180 degrees and not in front of you? So if you do just a little movement with your cursor, with your mouse, you can first of all determine is it in front of me or behind me, which sometimes isn't clear. But then better than that, doing that little flick back and forth, you can figure out where the center point of the sound was, you know, because if you go left quite a ways and then right just a little bit and it centers the sound for you, maybe you were off initially. So keep that in mind when you're trying to localize sound, especially when it's close to you. You want to avoid swinging your mouse because that makes noise. But doing those little shakes back and forth can help you determine the center point of where that sound originated. Absolutely. And I think localizing sound is something you just kind of have to practice and realize that you're going to be wrong for a while. <laughs> I'll give some hope to people out there who are frustrated with it or maybe struggling with it. I myself struggle with it at times greatly. I'm like, there's no way. And then, of course, I'm 180 degrees off or I'm 50 degrees off or whatever. And then I die because someone gets me, but it's not an easy thing to do. And I think that uh, it's just something you have to practice. Yeah. And this is kind of something that, you know, the more experience you get in FPS, the more natural localizing sound is. But if you're new to PC, if you're new to Tarkov, if you're new to this kind of game where you can be killed really quickly and it's not just like you respawn and try over, you lose your stuff. It does come with time and it can be challenging. The thing that I've talked about and you and I have talked about this all the time is, are you trusting your audio? Right. And I, I'm, I keep coming back to the same point is you heard something. What are you going to do about it? And when you don't trust your audio, it leads to inaction. But making the decision when you hear something to say, I know I'm going to stay here and I'm going to cut off this angle unless I hear something that makes me change where I'm going to look. That's a decision. If you don't trust your audio, it can often freeze you. It can freeze. You know, I've done this where I'm like, I don't trust that and I freeze and that's when I get into trouble. You know, so that's something that when someone talks about sound or it's come up in Discord where someone's like, man, I'm just really struggling with the audio. I'm like, you have to get to the point where you trust your sound so you can make good decisions based on that. Yep. And of course, if you are playing patiently and you're trying to figure out what to do, there's one thing that is the opposite of trusting sound that you can have some fun with that can help you. And that would be launching a grenade in a different direction. I think that it's super important that we talk about grenades because they can be a distraction. They can be an, obviously an offensive weapon. They can be a defensive weapon on the run. But the point is that if you have to wait for something to come to you or if you're in a sticky situation that you just have to sit and wait for something out, 
grenades are there to help. Absolutely. If you're an aggressive player, I think the best use for grenades is moving a patient player. Alternatively, if you're the patient player, I think the best use of grenades is divert is making their attention go somewhere else. One of my favorite plays to do on factory is get up onto the rafters just outside of the breezeway and chuck a flashbang or a grenade back into the farthest corner I can towards the forklift spot. If you do this a couple raids in a row, I'm almost guaranteeing that you will either have a PMC come screaming out of the office, out that little breezeway to the catwalk there, or they'll go down to the main floor and start heading over to the forklift area, and you're just going to be sitting right above them and just pick them off. So don't be afraid to make noise as a distraction, and grenades are an amazing tool for this, especially if you can launch it in a complete other direction and, and make somebody think you're on the other side of the map. I think that's a great point, and it really doesn't matter how you play Tarkov. You can use patient play. You, don't, you can be a full-on aggressive player. You could be a full-on passive player. It doesn't matter. Patient play will fit into any game style, and that's the cool thing about it. So it's something to think about as you're thinking about your raids, what went right, what went wrong. Use this as another technique, another tool in your arsenal to conquer the Tarkov map. But that's about it. I think the green bar is starting to flash. I definitely see it, which means we are moments away from disappearing. As always, thank you to all of you for being part of the Xville community. Thank you for listening to the show and supporting the show on all the different platforms that you consume it. We have one simple ask for all of you, regardless of platform that you listen or watch the show on. If we've earned a five star review, please leave it there. It helps get the show pushed out to more people and gets more people in the Xville community, which just makes the show better. If you're watching this on YouTube, thank you for doing so. Please click like. And if you like what you see in the XP Media YouTube channel, think about subscribing and leaving a comment and letting us know how patient play has either worked for you or not worked for you. Or if you have a good raid story, always love to see it there. Regardless of platform, be sure to check out Discord. Join Discord. We have a very, very active Discord with people playing basically at all hours of the day now around the world. We've got European players, got Australian players, we've got NA players, of course, and South American players. And come join. There's a group for you in Discord if you're looking for friends to explore Tarkov with. But that's about it. So good luck this week in all of your raids, whatever you're pushing for, whatever you're trying to get to. We hope that you're successful in doing it. And we'll see you again next week. Thanks, everybody. See ya.